Springs and trigonometry review going to be the topic of this lesson. We're starting a chapter on simple harmonic motion. Uh, and we want to review what we learned earlier in the course on springs, but also make sure uh, that you're up to speed on how sine and cosine functions work uh, with some variations thereof. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. So we'll start with a brief review of springs, which we covered earlier in the course. And if you recall, an ideal spring is one that follows Hooke's law. And Hooke's law just gives you the formula for that restoring force F equals negative KX where x is the displacement away from the equilibrium position. And the equilibrium position of a spring is the place where if you held on to that mass and you let it go right there, it would not move afterwards. So because if the displacement is zero, so and it's at equilibrium that it's defined as having a displacement of zero. Well, if the displacement is zero, we can see that the force would be zero as well. So the force is proportional to that displacement and also proportional to k, the spring constant. Stiffer spring tends to have a larger spring constant. Now, on the other hand, if we took and take it and stretched this spring over here to the point of maximum extension here and released it, so there would be a force snapping it back in the opposite direction. And so that's why Hooke's law describes the restoring force. If the extension, so away for, or the displacement away from the uh, equilibrium position is off to the right, the restoring force is gonna be off to the left and that's what the negative sign ultimately means. Same thing on the other side. If instead of uh, extending the spring, I compressed it to the left, so the restoring force would wanna snap back to the right. Uh, instead. All right, we also talked about potential energy of a spring, and we called it elastic potential energy. It's equal to 1 half k x squared, and so it's proportional to the spring constant, but proportional to the displacement away from equilibrium squared in this case. All right, so at the point of maximum compression, maximum extension, that is where your displacement is at a maximum, and it turns out, so in this chapter, instead of looking at a snapshot of one point in time, what we're gonna do is either extend it or compress it, and then we're gonna release that mass, and it's gonna oscillate back and forth, alternating between points where it's maximally extended and maximally compressed and passing through the equilibrium uh, position on the way through. And with an ideal spring, there's no internal friction or any non-conservative force, and so with an ideal spring, it would just effectively oscillate forever. And so the point of maximum extension and maximum compression, that's the point where your displacement is gonna be at a maximum, and so we call that the amplitude of the oscillations. All right, now according to Newton's second law, the sum of the forces equals ma, and so if the force is proportional to the displacement, well, so would the acceleration. In fact, we can write that mass times acceleration equals negative kx, get a new expression, and if we rearrange this and solve for the acceleration, we can see that the acceleration would equal negative k over m times x. And so not only is the force proportional to the displacement, but the acceleration again is also proportional to that displacement. And so in this case, if we have a displacement of zero, we're also not only gonna have a force of zero, but also an acceleration of zero as well. And at the other end, if we have the points where we have the, the maximal uh, displacement away from equilibrium, so if x is at a maximum, then the acceleration would be at a maximum as well. And so we've got maximum acceleration over at max extension, but also at max compression here as well. Uh, and once again, you're also gonna get the maximum force as well. Now, if we take a look at velocity for just a second, so we can take a look at this in, in one of a couple of different contexts, but probably the easiest one uh, is to review the conservation of mechanical energy. And if we take a look, we've got kinetic energy initial plus Potential energy initial equals kinetic energy final plus potential energy final. So, and this is not such a simple equation like we, when it was first introduced because now we have more than one type of kinetic energy we've learned. We've learned translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. And if you've got both types, you'd have to factor that in. And now we've also learned two different types of potential energy, gravitational potential energy if it's relevant, and now also elastic potential energy. And we'll learn another type in the second semester topics with electrical potential energy as well. So, so, but for now, this is not such a simple equation. So 
But what we're gonna do in the case of these oscillations, the height is not changing. And so gravitational potential energy is irrelevant because it's not changing. It'd be the same on the initial side and the final side, and it would just cancel out of the equation. Same thing here. We've got no rotation or torque going on in any way, shape, or form. So no rotational kinetic energy to worry about. And so in this particular example, we've only got translational kinetic, so as well as elastic potential to worry about. Now, if we take a look at the equilibrium position, again, where the displacement is zero, well, that means the elastic potential energy would also be zero. Whereas over here, we'd have the potential energy at a maximum, both when it's maximally extended or maximally compressed. All right, when you hit that potential energy at a maximum, it turns out you also reach the point where you get zero kinetic energy. And so the kinetic energy out here, is gonna be zero, as well as over here. So, but through the equilibrium position where we've got no potential energy, that's where the kinetic energy is gonna be at a maximum. So, and if the kinetic energy is at a maximum, then also your velocity as at a maximum. So, but at the extremes here, that's where the velocity also equals zero with the kinetic energy being zero. That's where the mass is gonna be compressing, 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 stop for a moment and switch directions. And in that process of switching directions, just like when we threw something up in the air, when it reaches its max height, so instead of traveling upwards, it freezes for a second before traveling downwards. And so uh, instantaneously it has a velocity of zero at its max height. Same thing for max compression or max extension. That's where instantaneously the velocity is gonna be zero there as well. All right, then if you're anywhere in between the equilibrium positions and either extreme, that's when you're gonna have both kinetic energy and potential energy. All right, so that's a pretty good review here. And one thing I just want to point out here is that right here, acceleration, it turns out, is gonna be proportional to the ratio of the spring constant to the mass. So, and I'll bring that back up in the next lesson. So it'll have some relevance there because we'll see this fraction showing up again in some of the terms we define. So it turns out that a mass oscillating on a spring, or it turns out also a pendulum swinging back and forth, can be modeled using sine and cosine functions, which we'll see in the next lesson. And that's why we're gonna do a little trigonometry review here, just to review how sine and cosine functions work so we're up to speed when we get there in the next lesson. So we start with the cosine function. So cosine function starts off at its maximum, so at zero. and then ends at its maximum after it's completed a full oscillation. And then this thing would just alternate back and forth as a wave all the way as you continue. So, but for one complete oscillation to it returns back to its initial position, that's where we go. And so in this case, you gotta know that for a typical cosine function, and in this case, this is gonna be simply cosine of x. We'll plot x here on this action, or cosine of theta if you want to go that route or something. And what you're gonna find is we're gonna start at zero and then go to pi over two, pi, three pi over two, and then two pi. So, and so in this case, we're not gonna be looking at this in terms of degrees. It turns out we'll be using radians instead, and that's gonna be super important in this chapter, and you should know that uh, pi is equal to 180 degrees. So pi radians equals 180 degrees. And so if you gotta do any converting between degrees and radians, there's your conversion factor. So if you gotta convert from radians to degrees, so you probably won't, but you multiply by 180 over pi. But if you're gonna uh, convert degrees to radians, that's when you're gonna uh, multiply by pi over 180. So uh, radians gonna be super important. So if you're doing any calculations in this chapter, odds are you're gonna need to convert the mode of your calculator to radians. All right, so here's our typical cosine function. So, and it turns out that this thing, uh, when you've got cosine of zero, so the function equals one. And so this thing's gonna oscillate, turns out between one and then over at the other end here, negative one, and let's put that in black. So for the cosine function, it passes through zero, right at pi over two and three pi over two. And then once you get to two pi, one full oscillation, so it goes back to one. 
All right, so for one full oscillation, so it takes two pi radians, and we call that the length of the period. And so for a typical sine or cosine function, the period is equal to two pi, it turns out. But we'll see some things can change that if you modify the function a little bit. Now the next function we want to take a look at is going to be two times cosine of x. And the thing here to realize is that cosine of x itself again, so it just alternates between one and negative one, one and not negative one, it just oscillates back and forth. Whereas any factor you multiply it by then, well here you're multiplying by two by a function that oscillates between one and negative one. Well, two times one is now two, and two times negative one is now negative two. And it's gonna follow the same pattern, so but instead of alternating between one and negative one, well, let's extend this up a little bit. Down, up to two over there, and down to negative two down here. So let's save a little room. So, and now we're still gonna cross through zero right at pi over two. We're still gonna reach our minimum at pi, still pass through zero at three pi over two, and then once again reach our maximum once again also at two pi. But the big thing that's different here is that our maximum and our minimum, our amplitude as we'll see, is now two, not one. And so any constant that you multiply here, and again this is two times cosine x, so any constant you multiply the, uh, the function by, so whether it be a sine or a cosine, it turns out, is just gonna take the minimum and maximum values to be that constant. Okay, so now we wanna go back and look at one other variation of the cosine function. And instead of multiplying the entire function by a constant, we actually wanna multiply the inside function by a constant instead. And so the function we're gonna look at is cosine of two x. So we'll multiply that inside function by two and see how this affects things. Now, if we look at the original function here, well, cosine of zero is one, cosine of pi over two is zero, cosine of pi was negative one, cosine of three pi over two is zero, and cosine of two pi, we were back to one, and we completed one full period. Well, if you multiply the inner function by two, you get to all these points twice as fast as one way to look at it. So if you start with zero again, and if x is zero, well, two times zero is still zero, and you'll still take in the cosine of zero, and so you're still gonna have a cosine of zero, and that's when the cosine function equals one. So we'll start there. Next, we'll go to pi over two. Well, pi over two times two is pi, and the cosine of pi, well, that's when it reaches its minimum at negative one. And so, but we didn't reach it when uh, we had cosine of, uh, or when x equaled pi, it was when x equaled pi over two. So we had to multiply by two, and so that's gonna reach that point right there. Moving on to pi, well, if we go to pi, so cosine of two pi, well, cosine of two pi is back to one. And so by the time we reach pi, we're all the way back to our maximum right there as well. And so by the time we reach pi, we've actually already completed one full oscillation here, one full period. So, and we can do the same thing going on our way back and go back and at three pi over two, we'd reach our minimum again. And at two pi, we'd reach our maximum again. All right, and so the big thing here is that we see that when you multiply the inner function by two, the period is now half the length. So I will explicitly state that a little more carefully in the next lesson. So, but I just wanted you to see how this affects. If we had multiplied by three, so then instead of fitting two oscillations in, in a, uh, a region of two pi, we would have fit three complete periods or three complete oscillations from zero to two pi. So put a four in there, you complete four complete oscillations from zero to two pi so on and so forth. So the bigger this factor on the inside function gets, the shorter and shorter the period is going to be. All right, so that's cosine functions. Let's take a, a quick look at sine functions and see how they're exactly analogous. So now we're gonna take a look at the sine function and if you take a look at a, either a sine function or a cosine function over, extended over many periods, you're just gonna see an alternating wave. So it's gonna alternate between positive one as a maximum and negative one as a minimum. So the big difference though is they're gonna be, uh, we say out of phase relative to each other or shifted relative to each other. So whereas the cosine of zero is one, the sine of zero is zero. And so the sine function starts at zero. And then the sine of pi over two, that's where it equals one. The sine of pi goes back to zero. The sine of three pi over two is where it hits negative one. And then the sine of two pi goes back to zero. And that's where it's completed one full oscillation here. So if we map out the function, there's one full period of the sine function. This is sine of x.
And just like we did with cosine here, what we want to do is multiply the entire function by a constant. And whereas the sine function again alternates between 1 and negative 1, any constant you multiply by, therefore, is going to kind of hit the upper and lower boundaries, the amplitude, we say, which in this case is going to be 2 and negative 2. If I multiplied by 10, it would be 10 and negative 10, so on and so forth. And so in this case, we're still going to start at 0, but now we're going to hit a maximum here at 2, still cross through 0 at pi, but then hit a minimum and then get back. And that way it's alternating between 2 and negative 2 at its maximum and its minimum, but still crossing 0 at exactly the same points for 2 sine x. So also just like we did with the cosine function, now we want to take a look at what happens when you multiply the inner function by a constant yet again. And so we'll compare sine of x to sine of 2x this time. So and it's going to accomplish the same thing it did with cosine. It's going to kind of speed up, if you will, how soon we get to each point. And so if x is 0, well, 2 times 0 is still 0, and the sine of 0 is still going to be 0. But now if we plug in pi over 2, so, well, 2 times pi over 2 is pi, and the sine of pi was 0. So move on to pi, and all of a sudden you plug in pi, and the sine of 2 pi is also 0. And what you're going to find is that you're going to hit your maximum halfway between 0 and pi over 2, and your minimum halfway between pi over 2 and pi. So it turns out this is pi over 4, and this is 3 pi over 4. I'm not going to highlight them, though. So, but you'll see that you complete one full period now by the time you reach pi, whereas the normal function doesn't reach a full period until 2 pi. Multiplying by the inner function by 2 makes the period half as long. We get to the, uh, one, we complete one full oscillation, if you will, in half the time or uh, half the, the displacement. In this case, it turns out half the x. So it'll be half the time as we see in the next lesson. So, and we could keep going. and get two full oscillations in the distance of 2 pi. So sine of x just completes one full oscillation over 2 pi. So sine of 2x completes two full oscillations over 2 pi. Sine of 3x would complete three full oscillations over 3 pi, so on and so forth. So that's about what we need uh, to do sine and cosine functions in the next lesson uh, when we get to simple harmonic motion. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.